Okay, so um, I'm going to speak about joint work with Zheng Fang Wang, uh, who is at Stuttgart and will be at the, the Hauserv Institute this fall. Uh, and uh, some of it at the end is also joint work with Ed Siegel at UCL. Uh, and I'm going to speak about something called Tate Hochschild cohomology. So this is um, something which I don't, not expecting that you know about already. So I will briefly introduce it, and then I'll explain what you get when you just analyze hypersurfaces. So what the theory attaches to the hypersurfaces in an affine space. And I'll say something about uh, the deformation theory and its connections to uh, Tate Hochschild cohomology, namely the deformation of singularity categories. And finally, uh, some comments about the relationship between Z and Z mod two graded cohomology, because the point is, of course, um, so uh, as I'll say, Dieckerhoff studied the Z mod two graded version of this the theory of this Hochschild uh, cohomology. Okay, so let me um, talk about Tate Hochschild cohomology. So I'm going to start, I'm not going to introduce Tate cohomology because of limited time, but it's in the first the slide if you uh, want to, to see a refresher, but I won't use that. So let's recall that the ordinary Hochschild cohomology with coefficients in a bimodule is the, can be computed as X from A to M, where in the, we're working in the bimodule category, AE modules are bimodules, right? So, um, uh, so uh, we're going to take um, an associative algebra and we're going to take um, uh, AE as this tensor product of A with A op, sorry, A with A op. And, um, and so now uh, to compute this theory, one thing we could do is we could take the uh, Hochschild, um, we, could, we could compute this Hochschild cohomology as the cohomology of Hamms from a projective resolution of A to M. So we'll take this projective resolution here a bimodule resolution. So of course, A is a projective A module, but not a projective A bimodule. So we take the resolution. Okay, so um, now we can do something with this. We can uh, define the bimodule dual, which is Hamm's uh, from, oh, in the bimodule category from M to A tensor A, or just AE, if you like. Uh, and this is a bimodule using the interaction on A tensor A. So the case of a group algebra over K, it turns out that this, um, and let's let K be a field here, sorry. So if K is a field, and we use the group algebra, and this M to M check, this bimodule dual is actually an anti-equivalence. And as a result of this, we can actually construct this two-sided complex where we take the bimodule resolution, and then we take its bimodule dual. So we're taking the bimodule resolution, and then we're taking its bimodule dual. Okay, and uh, as a result, uh, we get a two-sided complex, which is actually completely acyclic because um, because um, the co-kernel of p1 going to p0 is exactly the kernel of this p0 check going to p1 check. So we get this exact complex with no cohomology. But if we take its Hamms back to M, we get a theory which, in positive degrees, is the Hochschild cohomology. And in negative degrees, it's the Hochschild homology. So it's some kind of a cohomology theory which splices together Hochschild cohomology and homology. And by the way, this is a this is an analog of Tate cohomology. That's why we're calling this we call this Tate Hochschild cohomology because that uh, does the same thing for group homology and cohomology of a group. In this case, the group G, we could have defined that as well. Um, of course, group cohomology is X in the ordinary module category of K to uh, your M. And this all works more generally if A is Frobenius over K. So we didn't really need the group, the finite group here. Uh, I forgot to say G was finite, finite group. We didn't really need that. We just needed to have a Frobenius algebra and then we could have done all of this. Okay, so let's uh, move on here. We can generalize further. So even if we're not using a group, um, a group algebra, or even a Frobenius algebra, as long as we just have this star, this, this exact complex on two sides that has the A uh, in the middle here, as the co-kernel or the kernel of these um, of the maps in question, then we can still form this theory, and we're going to call it the tate hochschild cohomology and homology, all right? So there's a formalism which explains its meaning developed uh, 
by uh, Buchweiz in 1986. So let's let A be Gorenstein and Netherian, okay? I can, I, I can um, leave some of this up. So um, if we're Gorenstein and Netherian, then we have an equivalence of categories between acyclic complexes of projectives. So this star is an acyclic complex, right? This thing here is an acyclic complex of projectives. Um, and, um, and we mod by homotopy. So this is the homotopy category of this. And we get an equivalence to maximal Cohen-Macaulay modules by taking this, um, this is just taking this thing which was A here, the co-kernel of this map from P1 to P0, okay? So we take this co-kernel P1 to P0. And then we can further get an equivalence to, so this is gonna actually give us equivalence as he explains uh, to the category of maximal cohen macaulay modules. You'll always get such a module out of this module of the projectives. Um, and then finally, uh, we get an equivalence to the derived category of bounded complexes of A modules, modules of the perfect ones. Perfect ones means that all of the terms are finitely generated projectives. Um, and that's just taking a module, maximal cohen macaulay module to its image. So as a result, the composition gives us an equivalence between these acyclic complexes like we were studying and objects of this category called the singularity category. So as a result, we can define, this is the singularity category we just defined, and as a result, we can define the tate hochschild cohomology as just X in the end in the singularity category from A to M. So this is the singularity category of AE, right? The singularity bimodule category, if you like. And we can define X in there as this Tate Hochschild. And what it will give us is exactly what we were looking at up here. So in the finite case of finite groups or Frobenius algebras, it'll give us exactly something that splices together the Hochschild cohomology and homology, just like for group cohomology. Okay, so we get this theory. And I want to point out that this right-hand side here, we didn't, although to motivate this, I used Buchweiz's theorem for Gorenstein and Ethereum case, actually this singularity category makes sense for any associative algebra. So we can always define this theory. So this is, this is the tate hochschild cohomology. This is tate hochschild Okay. All right. Um, so, um, so I'm gonna give an example. Was there a question? Um, I, I leave some microphone is, uh, is not muted. Uh, so please, uh, everybody who is not the speaker, mute your mics. Thank you. Okay, so, um, so let's give an example of this. So I already mentioned what happens for group algebra. So let's give an example. It's not a group algebra, but close to being a group algebra, sort of similar to a group algebra, I mean. Take the truncated polynomial algebra. So this guy, of course, it's not a group algebra, right? But it, it but um, but I want to point out that um, it's still finite dimensional. It's Frobenius that has many similar properties. Let's see what we get here. Actually, because it's Frobenius, I already know that it would that the result will have to put together the um, the the hopes of homology and cohomology by what I explained. But let's look at it explicitly. So we have a two periodic resolution um, of A, right? This is a this is a bimodule resolution. So as usual, we resolve A first by multiplication, A tensor A to A, right? And then um, and the kernel of that is things that are multiplied by X tensor one minus one tensor X. Um, and again, because A is just generated by X, that everything that's in the kernel will be a multiple of that. Um, and then what things will be in the kernel of multiplication by x tensor one minus one tensor x, it'll be things that are multiplied by this power series. So this power series, of course, it's just x to the n tensor one minus one tensor x to the n over x tensor one minus one tensor x. Or if this looks a little bit strange, we could also have understood that AE is isomorphic to a truncated polynomial algebra in two variables. And we could think of everything as a module over that. So we could have X and Y mod out um, by, um, well, maybe let's say U and V, U and V, U and V, and mod out by 
u to the n and v to the n. And then this guy will be u, this guy will be v here. Okay, the, the x and x, uh, sorry, um, uh, this x tensor one will be u and one tensor x will be v. Okay, right. So, um, so this is a two-sided resolution. This is a two-periodic, I mean, resolution of A. As a result, the Hochschild cohomology only depends on the parity of I. And so the same will be true for the Tate Hochschild cohomology. So we get the answer is just that in every degree, we get something isomorphic to a truncated module mod X to the N minus one instead of X. So in even degrees, we're gonna take, um, we're going to take the co-kernel of, of A goes to A by multiplication by X to the N minus one, right? So this is the, uh, this is, we have this complex A goes to A multiplication by X to the N minus one. And we're gonna take the, um, the cohomology of that. So we have the, the kernel um, in degree zero is a co-kernel and degree odd degree uh, is, um, is the, um, the kernel, okay? So we get the kernel or the co-kernel multiplication by this, and that's the answer we get. So actually they're isomorphic in every degree, but, uh, but somehow we should think about the odd and the even degree as different. They're, they're isomorphic, but the, but the natural expression only gives that the even degrees are the same and the odd degrees are the same because it was only two periodic, not one periodic. It turns out that you get the same, and I'm gonna explain this a little bit more later. But first, I want to note that this is an associative algebra, this um, Tate hope, so we can just multiply, uh, for example, in this um, truncated ring. And I'm gonna say more about it later, but by definition, um, actually Tate hope cohomology is always an associative algebra because it's, uh, after all, it's x, self x of a in the, in the uh, singularity bimodule category. But it turns out to be a Gerson-Haber algebra. And this is a theorem of my collaborator, Zhang Fang Wang, in 2015. So the commutativity, graded commutativity was known from some time ago, um, at least in the case, in certain cases where you can define it, like in a Frobenius algebra case where you can define it uh, explicitly by an explicit complex. Okay, so let me now move on from the truncated polynomial algebra case to the hypersurface case. So this is of course a generalization because uh, you can think of a truncated polynomial algebra as the hypersurface x to the n equals zero, right? Inside of a one dimensional space. So now I'm gonna look at a, a more general hypersurface. Um, so I'm gonna take a polynomial ring in n variables and mod by some some polynomial f. So what's the motivation for this? I just saw that in this case, we had a two periodic resolution for the case x then equals zero in, in the line. This is a fat point, right? Um, and now we're gonna, we actually was observed in 1980 by Eisenberg that this two periodicity is a property of hypersurfaces. So he said, that every finitely generated A module has a projective resolution, which is eventually two periodic. So it's not gonna be always two periodic, but eventually it will be. And the ones that are immediately two periodic are again, these ones I talked about before, these Maxwell Cohen Macaulay modules, um, which appeared in the theorem of Buchweitz in 86, six years later. So uh, the, these modules have a two periodic resolution from the start, but in general, we, we may have something that's not two periodic, but eventually it'll become two periodic. This gives a connection between uh, Maxwell Cohen Macaulay modules or general modules that you cut off the head of the resolution and matrix factorizations. Namely, we look at our periodic uh, complex, uh, our periodic resolution, and we look at the two different differentials. And the two different differentials, differentials, let's suppose that the resolution is a free resolution, and they can just be thought of as um, matrices, M by M prime and M prime by M matrices whose composition uh, are zero mod F. And in fact, it turns out that it, their actually composition is just F times identity. So this is a factorization of the matrix F times identity. So it's a matrix factorization. And so one can define the Z mod two graded matrix factorization category is just the category of such D and D prime, right? Well, you have to have A to the M going to A to the M prime going back to the A to the M, uh, but it will be, um, uh, such a factorizations. 
Okay, so this is this is the motivation. And we should we should really think about if we want the the composition to be F, it, then they um, are thought of as matrices, not not going from A to the M to A to M prime, but rather going from R to the M to R to the M prime and back. Okay. Um, right. So this is uh, the motivation for considering hypersurfaces and the singularity category for hypersurfaces. Now, let's try to compute the Hoekschel cohomology or the tate hoekschel cohomology of a hypersurface. So um, if we want to compute it explicitly, and especially in such a way that we can commute, compute these gerson Haber and other you know, higher algebraic structures, um, then you want to have an explicit resolution. So the Buenos Aires cyclic homology group, or the Bach group, in 1992, gave an explicit bimodular resolution, which is too periodic in this case. So using that, we can do a computation, and we can extend it if we want to a um, to a to a uh, complex on two, it goes infinite in two different directions in two directions. So we can slice it with its dual and get this tate hochschild theory. So what do we get as a result? So I'm going to give some theorems uh, joint with my collaborator, Zheng Fang Wang. Uh, so for isolated singularities, let's start with that. What is an isolated singularity? That means that, so this is the singular locus, right? That were the derivatives of f are all zero. So, so df dx one equals equals df dxn equals zero is the singular locus. So we're going to assume that the singular locus is finite. Uh, that is, if we have isolated singularities, that's equivalent to saying that this ring we get by modding by these um, these singularities is um, is finite dimensional. So we're going to assume that this is this is uh, finite dimensional. Okay. Um, and I don't know what happened here. Okay. So let's assume this is finite dimensional. Then it turns out that uh, the tate hochschild the cohomology is actually isomorphic to something which is built out of this Jacobi ring, we just uh, adjoin uh, alpha and T and take the differential, which is multiplication by F. So this is a complex. Um, this is a complex, it's just uh, JT. That's right, what it looks like, JT multiplication by F, okay? So it's similar to, uh, to what we we're looking at um, before. So we're simply going to multiply by f. So in even degrees, we're going to get, uh, this is even here, and odd. So in even degrees, we're going to get the co-kernel multiplication by f, and in odd degrees, we're going to get the kernel. So this is uh, what we get. And by the way, the co-kernel is what's also called the Turina ring. Um, so uh, let me write that, hh even, well, zero to be precise, hh zero, uh, is isomorphic to what's called the Cherina ring. That J mod FJ. Okay, so this is the answer that one gets. Now, what is the cut product in these terms? Well, if you multiply by the even degree elements, it's just multiplication in this uh, in this Cherina ring. So it's a usual multiplication by the Cherina ring. The multiplication in A, in J, I mean which descends to an action of the Chirina ring. But if you take a G and H uh, in odd degrees, so in the kernel of J going to F, J going to J multiplication by F, then it's more complicated. Um, how we're gonna express that is if you multiply two odd degree elements, you have to get something in even degree. So you have to go from the kernel of multiplication by F twice to the co-kernel. So how are we gonna do it? So we write, um, so I'm just giving you the answer now, I'm not explaining how you compute it. But um, you're going to write um, f times g, which is which is zero in j, right? So this is um, this is zero in j. Zero in j. But if the polynomial is not zero, it's going to be a sum of polynomials times partial derivatives of f, and the same thing for h. Okay. So now I'm going to explain what the formula is for the cup product. So, um, so this, the, the element um, here, so this, in the odd degrees, we could think about this as having an alpha in here, right? Because the alpha is this degree minus one element. So the, the odd degree element corresponding to G and H are the G alpha and H alpha, okay? 
these are the elements that we get um, in, let's just say, in HH minus one, okay? And if we multiply them, so we're gonna get uh, something in degree minus two. And the thing that we get in degree minus two is, um, is um, T inverse, which is degree minus two, times the sum of GI, HI, HJ, times this partial derivatives of F, this double partial derivatives of F with respect to XI, XJ. And it's extended K brackets T, T inverse linearly. So, um, so this is, I think, a non-trivial formula um, and, uh, and the way that we get it, you could get it from this uh, resolution, um, this Bach resolution, but actually um, the way that we get it is by, um, well, you'll see in the next slide how we're getting that. So we don't actually use a resolution, but it motivates uh, what we do. And I want to point out this has also a Batal and Vilkovsky structure. This is not just a Gerstenhaber algebra, but it's a BV algebra. So the, there's a BV differential, which is zero in even degrees. And in odd degrees, it's given by a nice simple formula. So if, again, if we take uh, G, which has this uh, form above, so G, which has this form up here, then uh, we can get a form in terms of the GIs for this BV differential. So the BV differential has to go from degree, this is degree 2M minus one. It has to go down to degree 2M minus two. And so that's exactly what happens. So we take the partials of the GIs with respect to the XIs so sort of the only thing you can imagine doing, we're gonna take their sum, and then we also can just get rid of the alpha and the T. So contract the alpha with the T if you like. So you should think about alpha, uh, um, you, should, you should think about T here as the differentiation with respect to alpha basically. So you contract the T and an alpha together. I wanna to point out that this does not come from the ordinary Hochschild uh, cohomology, right? It, this doesn't come from from the ordinary uh, Hochschild cohomology because, because this algebra A is not Kalabi Yau. So uh, whenever your algebra is Kalabi Yau, I think um, uh, Nick and other people mentioned something about this. Uh, maybe Florian mentioned something about this before yesterday. If you have a Kalabi Yau algebra, then it's Hochschild cohomology is a BV differential on it, it's a BV structure. But this is not true for a general algebra. And this algebra A is certainly not Clavio, it's not even smooth. It's a singular uh, complete intersection. Of course, it's Gorenstein, it's a, it's a nice, uh, it's a hypersurface, it's in particular, it's Gorenstein. It's a nice thing, but it's not smooth, it's not Clavio. It's Hochschild cohomology is infinite dimensional and does not have a BV structure, at least not in a, any way that I know. But we get a natural one on this Tate Hochschild version, so some kind of a uh, correction. So this thing is... Can I ask a quick question yeah. on the slides you've just? So the it looks like the product on the odd de, in of two odd degree elements is commutative, not anti-commutative. Um, um, uh, I see. Um, um, Yes, I, I see what you're saying there. Um, well, I actually didn't ask a question. My question was, is that expected? <laughs> but the, okay, <laughs> we'll leave yes, that. I, I, we can I, um, to the yes, I, I, um, let me, um, yes, you, you, you're right to ask that question. So I, maybe there's, um, maybe there's a sign I have to explain here. Let me, let me. Uh, oh, okay. Let's let's talk, talk about it in the discussion then. I'd like to see yeah, more. I'll talk yeah. about that in the discussion. I have to check the formula and see. To okay. Okay. Um, right. Okay. Um, is there any other question? Okay. So. Um, right. So. Um, so what this is saying is that this um, this singularity category behaves like an n Clavier category. So let's go to the general case, and then maybe this will also help answer the question you were just asking. You can probably figure out the answer from that. Okay, so the general case is we're going to take, uh, we're going to think about this hypersurface as actually um, a DG uh, algebra. Uh, so we're going to take the, um, the super space, uh, N 
even dimension than one odd dimension and put the differential on it that assigns the coordinate function on the odd direction to um, this function f that we're cutting out. So, so this is a sort of a standard way of um, sort of a GG resolution of the hypersurface algebra. And uh, so it's going to look like this. We take the polynomial ring, we tensor by the exterior algebra, and we tensor by this. Um, this is essentially the polyvector fields on the odd dimensional space, polyvectors on the odd dimensional space, uh, on the odd one dimensional space, I mean. And uh, we put the Schouten bracket on it with this FT. So this is, uh, this is an explicit uh, uh, model here. And uh, we're going to interpret T as the differentiation with respect to the alpha variable. So now with this, this interpretation, we can make sense of bracketing with FT. And so the statement is that that is the, first of all, that's the ordinary Hochschild cohomology. It's given by that differential. Um, and um, and um, now um, the, uh, the, Hoch the Tate Hochschild homology, by the way, um, I might have uh, glossed over this before, but um, so I'm mostly talking about Tate Hochschild cohomology, but you can also define homology. And the homology is given instead of homing from your two-sided complex, you tensor by it. Or uh, when, you, um, when you use the singularity category more generally, we can take Tor, right? So, um, so HH bullet is given by Tor with the same things in it. So you can define uh, also a homology version of this, which I was not saying too much about until now. So let's get back to where I was. Um, so now if you do the homology, you're going to get instead the differential forms. And instead of taking the bracket with FT, you're going to take the lead of it, okay? And now we have a duality between the tate hochschild cohomology and homology, which is just contraction with this volume form, dx1 wedge to the dot wedge dxn. So it turns out that this induces an isomorphism and uh, you can transplant the con differential uh, from, uh, the from the homology to the cohomology, and we get a uh, BV structure on the whole uh, tate hochschild cohomology. Uh, and by the way, we also, uh, in our work, we also give, we compute the A infinity structure on um, the uh, Hochschild cohomology and the tate hochschild cohomology using, um, using these uh, complexes. So this is an explicit description, and from this point of view, and uh, now um, this explains uh, what Ezra was, was just talking about, but I have to look at what the formula is exactly. So this is, um, and I want to point out also that, um, that from this point of view, you, it's very easy to compute that we have invariance under the Knorr periodicity. So there's a close relationship, and I'm going to say more about it in just a second, between this tate hochschild theory and the singularity category. And it's well known that singularity categories or structure of singularities in some sense uh, is invariant under Knorr periodicity, which means that you take your polynomial, you add two more variables and you add YZ to the polynomial, okay? So this is gonna be the Knorr periodicity. And uh, we'll see that if you do that, you get the same cohomology theory, isomorphic. Okay, so now let me explain what this means in terms of deformation theory. There's a theorem of Keller recently in, in eight, 2018. He proved that if um, under some weak, a weak assumption, relative weak assumption, that the bounded derived category of A is homologically smooth. So I'm not going to say what that means. Actually, Nick said what it means, that you're, it's perfect as a, as a um, bimodule over itself. But in particular, this is always true if A is a finitely generated commutative algebra over a field. Okay, so this is in particular this is not too much to ask in our case, um, over a perfect field, sorry, perfect field, or algebraically closed, obviously, would be fine. Okay, so if you're like that, and if your algebra A is a Therian, then we get that the uh, tate hochschild cohomology is actually isomorphic to the Hochschild cohomology of the DG enhancement uh, of the singularity category. So this is what, what Keller proved. And this is the hopeful cohomology of this DG category, okay? So therefore, the tate hopeful cohomology in a precise sense controls the deformation theory of the singularities of A. Okay, so what is that saying in our situation here? 
So, th so this is why now when I said about Kanara periodicity, we expect it would then would have to be true. It has to be true as a result of this, that the tate hoax with cohomology, um, it doesn't change if you add, do this Kanara periodicity operation, you add yz for two more variables. Um, okay, so if we go to hypersurfaces with isolated singularities, then uh, from what I said before, the second Hochschild cohomology, the singularity category, can explicitly be realized as this Cherina algebra. This is the, the Jacobi algebra mod F. It's called the Cherina algebra. But this is well known. Uh, this is well known to uh, uh, to uh, control the deformation theory of the singularity, because this is also the Harrison cohomology um, of uh, of your ring A. Um, at least uh, at least the completion of A. So we're only looking at this particular singularity. Um, okay. Um, so um, th th this controls the commutative deformations of A. Um, and now I have a question is, is this still true for complete intersections? So uh, I, I'm, I'm expecting that this, um, that the I'm expect, expecting that if you have also a a complete intersection with an isolated singularity, that this uh, tape Hochschild cohomology could could be equal to um, the Harrison cohomology in degree two. Okay, so we always have a canonical map. So what does this mean? This this identification is saying that um, deforming the singularities in the categorical sense is the same as deforming it in the sort of geometric sense. So we always have a canonical map from the Hochschild cohomology to the tate hochschild cohomology. And in the hypersurface case, as I was saying, it's just inverting this T element. So it's a localization. Um, now, my theorem uh, with the uh, Zheng Fang Wang is that the deformations in the kernel of um, this, uh, this uh, canonical map in degree two always induce a trivial infinitesimal deformation of the singularity category. So remember these guys here are gonna deform A, right? Whereas these guys by Keller deform the singularity category. So of course it should follow from that that if this map is a good map, you know, it makes geometric sense. And if you're in the kernel of this map, then those deformations of A should give you an isomorphic singularity category. So we proved this infinitesimally using the um uh, using an explicit interpretation of these co-cycles as giving you a deformation of your category so as a result keller's isomorphism is consistent with this uh, beta keller tells us that this tate hochschild remember is um uh, is the hochschild of the singularity category this color right so um so, okay, so this is, um, this is one thing that we can say. Um, so in other words, um, our theory uh, is explaining uh, in a precise sense, uh, what the, this, describing the singular, the, deforma the deformation theory of the singularities of your hypersurface. And um, the explicit information that we get about it is actually telling you something um, about the, the deformation theory. So let me um, finally let me say something about Z graded versus Z mod two graded categories. So when you talk about uh, these um, singularity categories, as I said before, for a hypersurface, um, Eisenbud noticed that this is closely related to. Um, uh, let's see, where was it? Um, uh, Eisenbud noticed that this is closely related to matrix factorization. So if you take um, any of these uh, three categories. And the equivalence um, given by uh, Buchweiz for a hypersurface, uh, then we're going to get also an equivalence with matrix factorization. So, in other words, Maxwell Cohen Macaulay modules in the hypersurface case are the same as matrix factorizations. And matrix factorizations, we see, uh, I said it's, it's natural to think of them as Z mod 2 graded versus Z graded. Whereas in all of this uh, story here, everything was Z graded. So, let's look at the difference between these two because. Um, this is motivated by the fact that uh, Toby Dieterhoff studied the Z mod two graded case, and, and as a particular consequence of his result, where he gave a compact generator of this category in the Z mod two graded case, he computed the Hochschild cohomology on the Z mod two graded case, and he found that in the odd degree at zero, 
and the even degree, you're getting this Jacobi, uh, um, this Jacobi ring, not the Charina ring, but the Jacobi ring. So it's just, again, it's just modded out, modding out by the um, partial derivatives. Okay. So this is uh, this is the uh, this is the uh, answer. But notice that in odd degree we get zero here. Okay. So this is not at all related. Look, doesn't all at all look like what I was just describing to you, where um, where um, we get this complex, right? We get j to j. We have the core kernel and the co kernel, right? So if I go to a slide that I'm not using here. In even degrees, we have the Chirina ring, but in odd degrees, we have this kernel. So we really have something which is in general non-zero in odd degrees. So I want to explain why that's the case, um, that when you do Z graded, you get some stuff in odd degree, and you don't if you're, if you're um, doing Z mod two grading, at least in the isolated singularity case. So here's the reason. We have a forgetful functor from Z graded categories to Z mod two graded categories. And by the way, if, you, if you're just tuning in for the end of the talk, I don't know what the chance of that is. What I'm saying right now doesn't use anything I said before. I'm just talking about some generalities about Z versus Z mod two graded categories. And then I'm gonna explain how that ties into what I was saying before. But for the moment, this is something very general. We can take a Z graded category, reduce the gradings mod two and get a Z mod two graded category. And similarly, if we have a Z mod two graded category, we can unroll it. We get something periodic. So we can take a Z mod two graded thing and think of it as a periodic Z graded category, the DG categories we're talking about here. So as a result, this singularity category, since I said it was equivalent to matrix factorizations, um, it's this uh, unrolled version of the Z mod two. This is for A, uh, for, this is for A, a hypersurface. Okay, we're not talking about the, uh, the general uh, case here. And I want to note, though, that, um, that if you take the Hochschild cohomology of, um, of, the, um, of the singularity category I was describing, you're not going to just get the same thing as if you do it in Z mod 2, which is what I was saying before. The thing on the right is concentrated in even degree, and this is not concentrated in even degree on the left. So the reason, as I said, this, 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 this is not the right guess. This is too naive, this guess. So I'm going to explain to you what happens in a in a more general situation. So let's suppose we have a Z mod two graded algebra, and we have a Z graded algebra, and the Z mod two graded algebra is isomorphic to the reduction of the grading of the Z graded algebra. So we're just going to forget from the Z to Z mod two graded algebra, and so B is what you get when you reduce the gradings of C mod two. So for example, such a C will always exist if multiplication of odd elements is zero, because then you could just put the odd elements in degree, say one, and the even elements in degree zero, and you would be fine. That would be a lift to Z graded. So suppose that we have a Z mod two graded algebra, which is reduction mod two of a Z graded algebra and grading. So then as a result, if you unroll the B, so G remember is the, un, sorry, is the unrolling functor. G is an unrolling functor. This is getting you a periodic Z graded thing from a Z mod two graded thing. So if you unroll the B, we're gonna get the unrolling of the reduction of C. That's just a joining T and T inverse of C. So you're going from something which is maybe only in degree zero and one or not necessarily in very many degrees and you're going to put everything in every translate by, by multiple of two degrees. So you're tensoring with um, T and T inverse. So this is uh, what we're going to get. Um, now, um, by the Kunit formula, this will then say that, uh, that the Hochschild cohomology of this, um, of this uh, C brackets T, T inverse is the Hochschild cohomology of C tends to the Hochschild cohomology of just polynomials in T and T inverse. This is just, this is just poly vector fields on the punctured line. On the punctured line. Right, because the Functions, polynomials in T and T inverse are polyvector fields on the punctured line. So, um, so as a result, we get that the Hochschild cohomology of this um, of this uh, Z graded category uh, is um, is actually going to be the Hochschild cohomology of the Z mod two graded thing uh, adjoin not just T and T inverse but alpha, which is which is the dif differentiation by T. 
So we're getting something which is in both odd and even degrees. It's because this, uh, this poly vector fields are in odd and even degrees, right? So really what I'm saying is that the correct guess is not just if you reduce a category uh, mod two, then you're reducing the Hochschild cohomology mod two. Um, I thought the other way around, if you take a Z mod two graded category and you unroll it, you're not just saying that you're gonna unroll the Hochschild cohomology, but you actually also need this differentiation with respect to the T because it's, a, it's like a tensor product of the algebra with polynomials in T and T inverse. So because uh, T is two in degree two, because T is degree two, this, this answer makes sense, even though B is Z mod two graded. And I wanna point out this is not true for an arbitrary Z mod two graded algebra. So not every Z mod two graded algebra is the, re is the reduction mod two of a Z graded algebra. And in particular, it's not gonna be true that the Hochschild cohomology of an arbitrary um, unrolling of a Z mod two graded algebra is just given by the original thing tensored by polynomials in alpha T and T inverse. So it's not gonna be tensored by poly vector fields on that odd line. So it's not gonna be like that in general. So this is what happens in the singularity case because there, instead of getting the ordinary tensor product, we have this extra differential, this perturbation. So for the quasi homogeneous case, actually in the quasi homogeneous case, this multiplication by F doesn't do anything, it's, it's, it's zero because of the fact that um, because of the fact that in the quasi homogeneous case f equals zero in the j in the in the Jacobi ring, right? So that f is equal to the sum of uh, x i times df the x i up to its degree. So this is some some degree, right? So because of that f is zero in j, so nothing happens, nothing changes for the quasi homogeneous case, but in the general case, we get a perturbation. So the theorem which explains this with Ed Siegel and the Zheng Fang Wang, is that if we take any Z mod two DG category or algebra, and we take the Hochschild cohomology of the unrolled periodic Z graded category, we're gonna get a perturbation of this tensor product, this thing where we adjoin alpha T and T inverse for T is d d alpha here. Um, this perturbation is trivial uh, if uh, if uh, we're in the situation where we just reduced a z graded category's grading mod two, um, and um, and also it's also trivial if we're just doing graded algebras or categories with no differential. This is a little bit less obvious, but if you just have a graded category with no differential. Uh, that Z mod two graded or graded algebra and you, and you unroll it and you're almost getting something which is a tensor product uh, up to some normalization. And the difference is to make this precise, uh, we can prove it if the characteristic is not two of the field. Um, I want to note that for F quasi homogeneous, it's actually not clear that a matrix factorization over a Z mod two graded case uh, can be unrolled to a Z graded one. Right, this is actually not, uh, this is actually something which is not really clear. So what we're really saying is um, if we have these differentials from, uh, um, so what I want to do is, um, so we can always unroll from Z mod two graded to Z graded by turning a Z mod two graded into something periodic. But the thing we can always do is lift the grading without unrolling, so keeping the dimension the same, but lifting the gradings from Z mod two to Z graded. So it's equivalent to saying if we had some matrix factorization um, then can we uh, lift these matrix factorizations to something which is Z graded? So it's not just going from odd to even and even to odd, but going by degree one, zero to one to two, et cetera. So this may not lift to Z graded, um, I guess instead of D and D prime, I should say D zero, D one, D two, et cetera, right? So the theorem does not, on its own immediately explain why for the quasi homogeneous case, we don't have to put a differential here. But I think that, that one way to explain it, maybe there's a better way, I'm hoping that we have a better way. So if any of you know something about this question, why this, uh, why we should have some kind of a Z graded lift in the quasi homogeneous case of the matrix factorization category, then I would like you to tell me. But I think anyway, if F is quasi homogeneous then using um, Dekerhoff's compact generator, we can see that this endomorphism algebra 
actually does have a Z graded lip. So then nonetheless, even though it's not obvious from the point of view I had before, I think up to maybe some tinkering, there should exist a Z graded DG category um, so that um, this matrix factorization category Z mod two is obtained by reducing the grading mod two. And that explains why the differential is zero, this, uh, this, this perturb perturbation differential zero in the quasi-homogeneous case, but not necessarily in the inhomogeneous case. Okay, so I uh, am out of time. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Travis. Um, any uh, brief questions? If I may. Sure. Um, well, thank you for a very nice talk. First of all, my question is um, uh, how much of, uh, of the story uh, will continue to hold if uh, the function defining your hypersurface, the f, is not uh, polynomial? In other words, if you've got, well, if you've got a, a ring of smooth functions, C infinity functions and several variables modded out by, uh, well, by a function, because I see that all the formulas seem to continue to make sense. So of course, so you lose all the uh, all these nice properties like the theory, and, but uh, it seems like uh, well, you're asking if it's not a polynomial. Is that what you're saying? Yes, if f is not a polynomial, if uh, and uh, if your a is the uh, is let's say a, a ring of uh, smooth functions, infinity functions, and several variables modded out by an element, a function. Yeah, um, this is a good question. Um, so we didn't. I first of all, I have to say I didn't. I didn't at all think about uh, this question yet, um, but um, uh, but um, yeah, I guess um, I, I I guess um, I mean you can first ask the question right uh, about um, what happens. Uh, what what is the module theory of this algebra? Where you you take smooth functions on um, on a hypersurface, and um, well, in, in algebraic geometry, you know where you're looking at a polynomial function, or maybe more generally, if you're looking at a complex analytic uh, function, then you know we, we have some view of of what the geometry of this looks like. Um, so I don't know to what extent, in the general smooth setting, the module theory of this um, these smooth functions on this zero locus of a function resemble it. I and mean, of course, you can have strange things that happen in smooth manifolds. Like you can have a function which is positive and it has no zero uh, zero locus at all or you can have like a uh, a strange zero locus you know like like a circle um x squared plus y equals n it can become just a point and x squared plus y squared equals zero so of course I, i'm not really an expert on this sort of thing but uh, what i would say is that if you can first understand the module theory of this and whether you know you have nice uh, resolutions a nice class of modules that resemble uh colin macaulay modules uh, in this case then um then yeah maybe then I would assume that uh, you'll have a nice answer for the Hochschild the cohomology. But I think that there's many other participants here who know a lot more than I do about this question. So I probably better not say more. Thank you. But uh, by, by the way, are, are you assuming throughout that uh, that your field, your ground field is algebraically closed? Well, usually I'm assuming K is, I'm not assuming anything about K, just a commutative ring. But occasionally I made a statement where I needed to be a field or, or even a, um, a perfect field. So uh, for this um, result of Keller uh, to talk about uh, the uh, tate hochschild cohomology as actually the Hochschild cohomology of the singularity category, we need, I believe, the K to be perfect. Um, but I don't think I required it to be algebraically closed anywhere. Um, the, the point is somehow that you can, uh, so if you have a Frobenius algebra over a field, and you have a really nice situation where duality is, you know, um, is an anti-equivalence um, of modules, uh, so left with right modules, etc. And that's not true if you're not over a field. But for the purposes that I'm talking about here, I'm just looking at resolutions of A as a bimodule. So then it doesn't really matter because A as a bimodule will be nice. Uh, you know, it'll be a nice a projective module over R K, say. So um, then it's not a problem. Thank you.